What's up team? I hope you all had a great weekend. I've been very sick with COVID for the past week. And so for today's video, I have a really interesting idea. I wanted this to be more chill. And instead of me going through, you know, blasting off about everything that happened in the market today, I actually wanted to make this a little more of a charting session and how I would be striking up my charts, go a lot more into detail about, you know, order blocks, talk about potential setups and make this more of a vibe of us just chilling. I'm sipping some tea right now, depending upon where you are right now, maybe call and I kind of want to go a little more in depth, uh, probably for the technical analysis people. So if you're somebody who is owning shares in Tesla long term, I would still say that you should know how to basically at least read a daily and a weekly chart. Fundamentals are extremely important, but I'm telling you that once you can learn to read even the most simple technical analysis, we're not going to be focusing on predicting the future, but you will very easily be able to understand where institutional levels are. Therefore, you can be buying and selling where big money is buying and selling. We're also going to be going over my position in Tesla, why I ended up hitting a really solid day trade, why I added to my calls today, why I'm still holding March calls, and we're going to go over why I open puts on the S&P 500. So let's start first just by making this very simple. So the charting software that you see in front of you is a company called TrendSpider. I am affiliated with them, but you definitely do not need them. You do not need any specific type of charting software. Most of the things that I use here are all going to be either free on TradingView or some form of them. You do have a premium indicator within our Discord community that also shows you all of these levels that you can just import into TradingView. We're going to come over here. I'm going to turn off my trading bot section. We don't really have to look at that right now. So I'm going to get rid of everything at this point. What I want to go through is just show you guys what the chart is going to look like without me doing anything to it. So the first thing that we have to notice before we turn on any types of indicators is just going to be where's the trend and what has the stock been doing? So the first thing that we're going to obviously notice is that we have these three points that is going to show a very strong trend line. So you can see we have one here. If we were to attach this to another, we have it here. If we were to attach one here and just continue our way down. Now, here's the thing, right? Drawing these trend lines, depending upon who you are, it depends. Some people like to use wicks. Some people like to use bodies. Some people draw them crazy. Some people are absolutely meticulous where exactly where they put them. For me, guys, I'm just watching for general direction and general trend. In most most cases, and I mean, I've been doing this for nine years, but in most cases, I'm not looking at pinpoint specifics right around a trend line. I just want to know, okay, this is the overall trend. Where is the overall resistance? And then where is big money liquidity levels in correlation to that? And the first thing that you have to understand is, are you going against the trend? So in this case, is the trend going up? Is the trend going down? Or is the trend sideways? And we can see that depending upon the time frame and depending upon what candles you're looking at, that will change entirely. And I think that this is where people kind of get caught up in not knowing where the trend is because they'll look maybe from October and then they'll look at like a three month chart. The best thing to do is just to zoom all the way out, look at the stock and say, hmm, what generally has been happening? If we just look at the past year from January 2023, Tesla is definitely in an uptrend over the past year. And now as we're moving in this uptrend, we're seeing these resistance points. Now let's look at some horizontal levels. This is still guys with no indicators. Remember, we don't need to have a ton. What we're going to do is just take a horizontal chart and we're going to put it at a level that we see multiple layers of support at. So the first thing to notice is if I were, you know, let's just chuck it here. We don't even have to go through and do anything crazy with it and we'll extend it all the way out. And so now let's just take this and just be like, okay, where do we see this? Okay, here we go. If I were to lay a horizontal level out here, you're going to notice that we have bounced multiple times off of this support. And if we were to go through and clone this, we can pull this up. You can see, okay, there was one here where, you know, this is an area where we had resistance. But if we move this up, this looks like a bit bigger of an area. So some people, like we've said before, they're very meticulous, very pinpoint about where they're going to put them. But for me, I'm really just watching 260. And so if we trace these levels off as general price levels, 260 to 265 has been a strong resistance and 230 to about 225 has been a strong support. All right, cool. So now that we have this understanding, we can either keep these up or for me, I just remove them because I don't, I don't need to have these up and we can start throwing some indicators on. Now, what are the indicators that we're currently going to have on this chart? You can run moving averages. I'm going to turn off my 11 and my 50, but what we're really running is order blocks and fair value gaps. Those are going to be the most important things on top of a volume profile, which is the horizontal thing that you see here. And I'm going to explain it in a moment. So now you're going to see just like we kind of drew out with that horizontal line earlier that $260 is not just a resistance level that we 
we saw by eye, but now that we have these order block indicators on, this is actually where there are still big limit sell orders sitting between 260 and 280, which means that this is going to be a strong resistance point as we've been talking about for a while now on Tesla. So what's nice to know is that, okay, we saw 260 with our eyes, and now the fact that there's a lot of current order blocks sitting there, we can now confirm the fact that this really is a strong resistance point. So once again, you can keep this up or we're just going to go ahead and remove it. Now, before we move into fair value gaps, I just want to talk about the volume profile, which as we said earlier, is this horizontal bar on the right side of your screen. And now normally you're going to see volume at the bottom of your screen that looks like this. These volume bars are great. And what they show is how many shares were traded within a specific day. And this is very good because as I say, a lot of the times we want to be trading with volume and more so we want to be trading with higher amounts of volume. Now, the one thing that that's not going to show us is actually where is the price coming in at? Where has big money been purchasing at? And now, now the problem though, is that those vertical bars at the bottom that you just saw are not going to show us where price is coming in at. Instead, we can use what's called a volume profile or a volume by price. And we can actually see over a set period of time, where has big money and institutions been purchasing at? And so you can see mine starts back here on March 1st of 2023. Normally I'm looking at one year on the daily chart or 252 candles. That's usually what I set mine. Now, the first thing I want to highlight here with our tool is going to be this big block here from about 264.20 all the way down to about 234. This area on the volume profile is one of the highest areas of volume that we have. And this red line here that says POC, that means point of control. The point of control is going to be the highest level of volume within that time range. And it is always going to act as a very strong resistance and a very strong support level. As well, during these major levels of volume, which you can see here, we can have a ton of consolidation that happens within these levels. So you can see that we have the first one from here, like we said earlier, of 265.50 down to about 235. And the second level within the past year is from about $200 down to 150. This is going to leave a couple of spots, one at 234.77 down to about 200, which will mark off as green. Another area from about $265 all the way up to $300 plus, and then a very small area down here of about $150 to about 100 bucks. To some of you, this might look crazy, and I never draw this out because I've been doing this for so long, but I want you to kind of think of these levels as not stop and go levels, but anytime we're in the green, the chances of an extremely volatile move within a very small time frame has massive potential. And you Usually, if we're within the blue level or the levels where there's massive areas of volume, we will tend to have more consolidation, which you can see here plays out to perfection. We had consolidation here between 201 down to 150. You could have been closing at these tops, purchasing at these bottoms, saw the breakout, and then look what ended up happening. We consolidated here for two and a half months, followed by a breakout of about 15% in just one week and one day or six trading days. And now remember, these are the moves we want, especially if you're somebody who is trading directional options. Imagine what 15% within one week and one day with appropriately risk position size. Imagine what that type of return would do for your portfolio. We can go over in another video on how to tell when these will actually be breakouts versus when these rejections will happen. But this is what we're looking for. From this point, we push up, we pull back, and then we break out again into this high area of volume. Now, the thing I want you to understand is that when we pushed back up into $300 back in July, we were unable to hold because of earnings, which you can see here, we gapped down. We tried to hold support, gave up 260, came back down to 234. And if you guys who are with me for a very long time now, you remember that all the way back here, we thought that this drawdown through 233 was going to pull all the way back down to this support level. But but once again, look at how volatile these moves are. A 9% drop in one week, followed by a 10% rip in two days. This move up here was 14% in just two weeks. And so through these areas, this is where we're looking for those big moves, the massive risk versus reward plays. And as you
you can see here, this is why I've been bullish on Tesla. I thought we were going to break through 260, which has not happened yet. I'm still bullish for the next couple of months and we'll talk about why. But if this level of 235 was given out today, I was going to end up closing out my calls because I know that the chances of us pulling back down to $200 is extremely high. But luckily, we were able to hold. So let's come through here. I'm going to actually go ahead and delete all of these levels though. But this is something you guys should be marking off on your charts, especially if you're new to using volume profiles. So now let's talk about the actual indicators. We're going to pop these back on and we're going to start first with order blocks. This is not going to be a deep dive on order blocks. Like I said, I'm just sitting here and going through on my charts. But basically when an institution is going to take a position on a massive time frame, okay, order blocks work best on daily time frames and weekly time frames. But when they are going to take a position, they can't just, like we said earlier, buy and sell. They need to be taking positions in high liquidity areas, meaning that they need other people to come in and satisfy that position to actually take it off of their hands. And these people can't just hit a market order for hundreds of thousands of dollars the way that a retail trader. So instead, what they will do is set limit orders. And so when you see a red order block, all you have to do is just realize that this is a limit short order for Tesla that somebody has placed, you know, this came in August 30th up here at about 302 to 309. We have two more limit sell areas from about 270 down to 250 and then a limit buy order down at 166. Now, like I said, this isn't going to be a massive tutorial on order blocks. You can do one and how I use them in my trading every day. I'm definitely not like a full-time ICT SMC trader, but I do like to use them in my trading bots and in a lot of my trades. But basically, this is a very good example of what could have been a potential breakout, but really this potential rejection. We had this sell-off coming out of this order block. And now the more recent the order block, first of all, usually the stronger it's going to be. And number two, the more chance of a move is going to happen. So when we saw this block come in, Tesla cratered, sold off, I mean, absolutely massively from 267.97 all the way down 27% within three weeks. Bouncing back up, we're going to come in here and test the middle. Now, some people, I think it's called a mean, but basically you can take your Fibonacci or any draw tool. And what you're really looking to do is to enter on the middle of that order block. So our time to go short would have actually been up here at 260. And if 260 would have broke out, we would have ripped right through this and guess where we would have ended up right at 300, like we were talking about for the past couple of weeks. As we said, we ended up rejecting, pulling our way back down to this support level. And if we hold 235, we might test this again. If we break through, great, we'll ride it to 300. If we reject, we'll have to reassess from there. Now, of course, bullish order blocks or more bearish order blocks could come in over the next couple of weeks, which could definitely change the landscape and the scenario of how Tesla looks. I will be honest that while I still have March calls because nothing major has broken yet, the only reason I still have calls is not that I'm uberly bullish or I'm so tickled that I think that Tesla's definitely going to hit 300. I'm still bullish because my predetermined stop loss, the predetermined level of 230 has not been broken. And so we will hold until otherwise. You can also see that from a technical analysis standpoint, we have a very janky inverted head and shoulders hat. As we said earlier, 260 was the eye level that we saw as a potential resistance point. This also correlated with these order blocks. This could be the neckline on the inverted head and shoulders. This happens when we have a pullback down, which is going to be the beginning of our left shoulder that pushes back up to that resistance level of about 260 to 261. This is an important level because this is our neckline. From here, we pull back not equally, but another leg down. A leg down just means a lower low. This is obviously bearish. Now, a normal trend or a channel would look like this. It would push back up and then equally reject right where that resistance point was, right? And then we could expect that if the rejection here happened, then we'd make a lower low. Instead, something different happens here. This time, we push all the way back up, not perfectly, and remember, it doesn't have to be, but we push all the way back up into this neckline area. We pull back down again, testing here, and it seems that this could be the right shoulder that's potentially in play for the move back up to $300. We were hoping for the breakthrough 260, so it didn't happen. Until further notice, we're waiting for either the break over 260 to ride it to 300 
or the break down below 230 to ride it down to $200. So with all this information that we have here on Tesla, let's go and look at some other stocks and some trades that we took today. Let's move over to Nvidia, which I did a full standalone video on, but Nvidia is up massively today. Over 7%, same deal here, guys. Symmetrical triangle this time, big bullish order block levels. You can see now that this is where that support level came in. And if you were to even turn off this order block, like we said, we could come in and notice that we have a major support level here on the daily chart. We can also come in and notice that we have a major resistance level on the daily chart. So now what has happened differently that has not happened all the other times that we had this breakout over this resistance level? Every other time, this false breakout quickly got sold off and slapped back under. There's still a chance that Nvidia could reject, but I highly doubt it. At this point, it looks confirmed and looks like it might hit $550. With that being said, though, it is definitely not worth it to go long at this point. And as we did talk about in that video, earlier, there is the chance of a potential rising wedge in play. Let's move to the S&P 500 because I ended up taking some puts on this. I want to share with you guys my trade. So I posted this within the Discord community and then I took a screenshot and I shared it to X. So I said 20 SPY February 16th, $475 puts. Average is $6.50. Remember as we posted in the weekly watch list, SPY is back up at bearish order block with a fair value gap to the downside. We're going to go over what a fair value gap is in a moment. Using this trade because it's here. Plus, Plus, as a hedge. All that means is that while I don't want to go against the market overall, I don't like going against the trend, the setup is in my face and I need to freaking take it. Plus, the hedge aspect I said at the end here was because I do have a lot of March calls. I did close a lot of my bullish positions out today and scale out, but I do still have a lot of March calls in place, so this will help to hedge. Target is $465 and $450 with a stop loss at $477.50. So let's see what's happening here, right? Obviously, S&P 500 in a massive uptrend. We don't really have to go through through what we did in the beginning of this video because we know that SPY is in a massive uptrend. So shorting this, usually just not a good idea for your average bear because if you're somebody who is new to trading, it's very tough to reverse and time the reversal of the market. Now, back in July, we had a short-term retracement, but the overall trend was still up. So remember, if you're somebody who is just looking at the S&P 500, you could have been just peering at this small time zone from basically July to November and think that we're in a downtrend. But in theory, if you look at minimally the past year, we were still in an uptrend. We have two massive bullish order blocks coming in here on support with an absolute shit ton of volume on the volume profiles. So from 415 to 407, this indicates that a bounce is coming. Big bounce on the bottom, continue to run, another order block comes in showing more strength. We continue to push up and then finally last week we see a bearish order block come in play. Spy pulls all the way back to fill our fair value gap. Now the blue line that you see here is going to be called a fair value gap. I'm going to go into it in depth. Like I said, with order blocks, I can do a separate video. But when we get these big rips, for instance, these pushes here, institutions cannot fill on the actual positions that they want to. The move happens way too fast. So what happens is there's an area of liquidity that has to be filled down to this level. And in most cases, we will see the stock recover back down to fill the gap before we get the rally. And in most cases, we will come back to fill the gap. From here, we did not fully fill the gap, but we did have a massive 1.35 percent return pushing back up here. Now, what do you guys notice, right? We said earlier to enter within these order blocks, preferably we want to be getting somewhere in the middle, but really we don't, if we don't want to be a stickler, we can just get in on the block. I ended up entering with puts earlier today. And what I think is going to happen is we'll end up rejecting, maybe have a little push up tomorrow, like 476 or maybe 475, 73, but I'm going to be looking for the potential rejection and the fill of this fair value gap. Something else to note here is if we take this horizontal bar, boom, you're going to see here, this is a potential neckline because on this smaller time frame, because you can see that as of recent, we have a potential head and shoulders pattern playing out on SPY with that bearish order block in place. If we actually pop into a one hour time frame, you'll be able to see this a little bit better. Now, the last thing I want to talk about on this setup for SPY is actually going to be the Fibonacci retracement because a lot of people ask me about Fibonacci's and FIBs are another one of those things. It's not an indicator. It's going to be a, a drawing tool but for a lot of people, they all use this indicator differently. Some people draw from wick down to wick. Some people draw from body down to body. In this case, we're going to be using wick to wick. And what we're going to be looking to do is to find times to potentially short when we're in a short-term downtrend or go long when we're in a trend. These 
can be drawn out on whatever time frames you want and as big as you want them. You can see here that if we were to take this Fibonacci retracement from swing high here on December 28th and to pull them all the way down, you're going to see that the three levels that I search for the most is going to be the 0.618, the 0.707, and the 0.768. This is called your golden pocket. Some people call it a golden bullet. Some people call it a Fibonacci. So this is the area that if we're going to reject, it's going to be within this area. So now we have multiple pieces of evidence pointing towards a potential S&P 500 short. So now how do we play this? We pop back open our indicators. And as we said earlier, we're going to be looking to go short where we currently are. This would be at about 474.58. We're going to take our profit and minimally shoot for the pullback through this fair value gap down to 426. We're going to take our stop loss and we could set it right here at 476, which would give us an amazing risk for reward a 10 to 1 RVR, which looks beautiful. But in reality, the chances of us getting tagged out are very high. I want to have a nice risk versus reward, but a still high probability of being accurate. So I'm going to move this to a higher high and set it at 477.89. This will now give me a 5 to 1 risk versus reward ratio, but now a higher chance of profit. And the chance of me getting shaken out of this is very low, essentially meaning me getting too worried, scared about the position, and then closing. If you wanted to be even safer, you could enter with half of your planned position. So let's say we wanted to go in with $10,000. We'd go in with $5,000 now, average down at about $476 so that we have an average somewhere around here. And then we could actually pull our stop loss to $477.50 and our take profit down to $464.21. This gives us, once again, a better risk versus reward, but a lower chance of this happening since, in order for us to get the full position, SPY has to rip the opposite of the way that we want it to go. These are all things that you have to take into account mentally, physically, emotionally when you're setting these trades up. Now, the the other thing to understand is that just down to 462 is just where the opportunity zone is. And so I see people draw out a lot of these positions and they're like, you know what? Like, yeah, if, uh, you know, we'll take profit all the way down here at like 450. And it's like, yeah, dude, this looks great. But like the chances of you not closing your profit when it drops to 460 is very low. Like you're going to take your profit and the chances of you closing right at 477.67 for me is high. But for the average individual who hasn't, not that I'm so amazing, but I just has not been executed executing stop losses for nine years the way I have, they might not execute the stop loss at 477. So you could sit here and think you have a great setup, but if you're not going to sell when you should sell, and if you're not going to hold it to your target, then what are we really doing here? We're just kind of mentally masturbating to charts. Instead, what I do is base it off of my area of opportunity. So I think that minimally SPY will hit 465 if this plays out. Really, if we look at the volume profile, next shelf support is 458. But if this trade makes sense with my worst case scenario, scenario profit target, then I know that it's a great trade for me to take. So now let's talk about some posts I made in the Discord today, going over a small account. I don't want to say challenge, but just a small account that I made with $2,000 at the beginning of this month. It is now up to $1,176. It is a 50% return in eight days. And I think this is going to be great to go over, not because it's a 50% return in eight days. I really don't give a shit about that, but because we're going to be able to go over how easily this account can blow up and not in a good way, because I want to shed some light on how risky it is to be trading with a small amount of money. If I only had two to three thousand dollars to trade with and I haven't been trading for nine years, what I would do is go out and instead spend the money on education. I would be going out and just paper trading, getting used to how the market works. I would not be throwing my money into live trades. But I posted this earlier and I said 50% return in eight days. I said we could easily sit here and post this like it's such a flex. The truth is with a highly profitable strategy and a winning one, we could have easily started out with two or three losers from the very beginning and instead be down 50%. So what does this mean? Let's go back to TrendSpider and let's look at my trading bots. If you guys do want access to all my trading bots, you can use the second link in the description to get access to our Discord. And here is all of the tickers that we trade. But now if we preload our trading bot, you're going to see that within the past year, we have made a 109% return while the asset has only gone up 38%. But something you need to understand, look at your max drawdown, 20%. Even with an amazing strategy like this, with a 76% win rate and a 100% return in the past year, at some point you would have went 
from being up 130% to only being up about 100%. Now you might say to yourself, dude, I don't give a shit because I still would be up 100% a year and I need to do this. But what I need you to understand is that imagine if instead of that, you actually started here. Because guess what, bro? This is actually where it started. You would have had this amazing strategy and look from December of last year to January of last year, an entire month, you would have done nothing but lose. Even with the best strategy, you can still take three, four, five, six losses in a row. And that's what I meant by this post. I easily, by the law of averages, could have just started in the sequence at a shitty point in time. And instead of being up 50%, now I'd be down 50%. So the chances of you blowing up an account that's going to be small is very, very high because you don't have enough capital to use the proper risk management systems that we're going to talk about right now. I said, luckily, this time didn't happen. So, so far in the past eight days, I took three trades, one on DraftKings for 320 bucks, one on ARKK for 208 and one on Disney for $648. I said, now that the account is up 50%, we will start to divide our risk up even more. Instead of two trades at a time with 50% of the account in each, we're going to move to three potential trades at 33.33% max. This will allow us to diversify more within our trades and therefore not have us explode if one thing goes wrong. Something that's very important here is that I will only be using 75% of this account, saving 25% of it on the sidelines. If we go into the Discord community, which you guys can get access to in the second link in the description and you're a private member of it, you can go and look at all of our live lessons and our quick references. And if we look over at the fundamentals of risk trading module, within the Discord, you're going to see that allocation size and working capital are two different things. You're going to learn what allocation size is. So allocation size refers to the portion of the capital that you're working with that you want to engage in trades with. So let's say we have a $100,000 portfolio. We're not going to take all hundred grand and put it into our trades. Even if it's diversified upon 10 stocks, we're not going to put all the money that we have to our name to invest in the market at one time. Now, once again, if you only have $2,000, this rule goes goes out the freaking window because you need money to trade with. So instead, as this small account begins to grow, what I'm going to do now is instead of trading with the whole account like I was before, I'm only going to trade with 75%. And then once this account gets up to four grand, I'm going to pull back even more and only trade with $2,000. So for the next month, even though my account might go up to four grand, I'm only trading with $2,000. So this way we can scale the account not as fast, but with less risk. And that's the goal. My long-term goal for this account is to only make about three to 5% a week. Now, the smaller the account is, the bigger returns you can push out of the market or attempt to push. I said, I know that I can win over time. But as said earlier, who knows what's going to happen next in our sequencing of trades and if it's going to play out the way that we need them to. We cannot afford to lose everything. Now, I did follow that up by a voice note with them, briefly explaining that even if we did blow up $2,000, I don't care, number one. But number two, even if it's your only $2,000 and bro, I've been there before. Freaking trust me, dude. Like I've been prison for months. I've been, I've lived off welfare for like 13 fucking years. Like I've been there, man. But even if you were to blow up your last $2,000 trying to learn a skill, which I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend doing this. I just learn the skill and keep the money on the side, put it towards books. But even if I blew up that $2,000, I really wouldn't care because imagine if we wanted to take $2,000 to go start a food truck or some sort of business, maybe a plumbing business or a contracting business. We wouldn't be upset if the business didn't work out and we lost the $2,000. Like maybe you would be, but you'd be like, dude, I tried and it was only two grand, whatever. If this goes from two grand to 20 grand to 30 grand to 50 grand, that's life-changing. But losing the $2,000 and gaining all the fucking knowledge that you'll have in the meantime is worth millions in your lifetime, dude. Just, I, I promise you, you just have to think long-term. And, and if you're sitting here and you're losing money, and because the reason that you might be thinking about quitting your investing journey or your trading journey is because this isn't as easy as you expected it to be. And the perceived likelihood of achievement is not as high as you thought it was when you saw everybody with Lamborghinis. But guess what? That's cool. And that's okay because there are people who actually do this legitimately. And that's what kept me through my darkest days. So I'll continue to monitor you guys on this and we'll see what ends up happening. If it blows up and we have a great account, this thing grows to 50 grand at the end of the year. Awesome. I'll sit here at the end of the year and be like, great trading, but this thing could have easily just, you know, went to zero. I'm going to remain objective the whole time. And if this thing turns to zero, I'm going to be honest and be like, dude, this thing blew up. Like maybe we'll try again. Maybe we won't, but let's see what happens because the biggest piece of bullshit that you're told is that having more money doesn't make it easy to make more money. Of course it does. It also makes it less risky, which is why nobody wants to go back and start with a small account.
out. It sucks. We work so hard to never have to do it again. So I hope this video helped, guys. Thanks for all the support. If you want to get access to all my trades, all my trading bots, all my premium indicators, private Discord, all the courses, check out the second link in the description. I'll see you guys next time. Peace.